Let's give her confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let us greet each other as, as well as our overseas believers. Let us become experts of choices. With this message, today's message is entitled, A Choice Between Two. And so I'm currently attending, I have currently attended uh, the North American Business Persons Events Conference on the Saturday core message. And so I will probably be on my way back when this message is being uh, when this message is being, um, you guys are watching this message. So today's message is entitled, the, A Choice Between Two. And this literally means choosing between two things. As we go through life, we face many different choices. But most often, we are faced with a choice with a situation where we have to choose one or the other. Should I say this or should I say that? Should I do this or shouldn't I do that? Should I marry this person or should I marry that person? Should I go to this job or should I leave this job? Or should I attend this church or not? There are countless decisions that need to be made. And this is true not only in our daily lives, but also in our walk of faith. In our spiritual life, we are always faced with a choice. And there are many situations this way, whether it is obeying the word proclaimed from the pulpit or disobeying it. Will I actually pray the covenant prayer or not? Should I go to the field or not? Uh, should I attend Sarah Sunday service or not? Should I be faithful to the church position that has been given to me or not? In etc. In some way, a spiritual battle is also a choice between two. Whether we follow God's will or are we are deceived by Satan's lie, even the incident in chapter 3 ultimately was a choice between two for Adam and Eve. Will they eat from the, the tree of the good, knowledge of good and evil? Will they be deceived by Satan or not? But they were deceived and they chose to do the opposite of what God said. And that's why problems arose. And we see how serious and devastating its aftermath is. That's why in Revelations 3, 15 to 16, it says, There is a message to the church in Laodicea. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Uh, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What does this mean? An ambiguous stance in our spiritual life is harmful to our faith. But it, you can't really tell whether one is really walking a walk of faith or whether they're really doing their ministries. If it's an ambiguous walk of faith, that is simply harmful it's useless there's one characteristic of unbelievers in the world it's that they have passion whether they do one thing they have a passion to do so so given the choice between two what should we do we should not live a cold life but we need to be filled with an evangelistic passion a life that is on fire are you still burning? William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, used to use this phrase whenever he greeted people. He'd ask, are you still burning? What does this mean? Is your heart still on fire? Is it still fiery? In other words, are you still on fire when it comes to passion for the gospel? Are you still burning? I'm sure when it comes to this question, our Ye all Yewon Church believers would say, Yes, I am. Confidently. And so I'll ask you, so may you answer, okay? Are you still burning? You have to say, Yes, I am. 
In my heart, there is still a burning passion for the gospel. That is what you must confess. When it comes to a walk of faith, it should never be ambiguous. Nothing is more unjust than to live a life of faith that is neither this or that. You're, all, you're already giving your time, your life, and living this walk of faith. And yet, if you were to live an ambiguous life without being used, wouldn't that be unfair? All believers in your church, may you live a life of daily growth, a life in which your evangelistic passion burns increasingly as time passes. That is the spiritual normal state. That is normal. All of the early church believers were like that. The religious reformation individuals were like that. And churches where revival took place, they were all like that. Let's say that when it comes to the associate pastors or the church officers, they look bored, or the pastors, when they preach, it seems like they have no passion. Then that is not a biblical walk of faith. That is not a ministry. That is biblical. And in order to maintain this spiritually normal state, there's something that's important, and that is to make the right choices based on the Word of God. Because choices determine the direction of your life. If you look at Mark 15, the choices of two people are contrasted. One was Pontius Pilate, and the other was Joseph of Arimathea. These two people make different choices in a dilemma. But the choices of these two people convey an important spiritual message to us. I bless all the believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to make spiritual choices that God desires and delights in throughout your life and have the evidence to enlarge the place of your tent through today's message. Point number one, Pilate who chose the introduction. If you look at verses 1 to 3, it said, Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Are you at the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. After being arrested due to the betrayal of Judas Iscariot, Jesus was put on an illegal trial by the Sanhedrin, which was the highest decision-making body of the Jews. The Sanhedrin comprised 71 members, including the high priests, its chairman, and 70 other members. The members included the Sadducees, who monopolized the priestly class, and the Pharisees, who were scribes, and the elders, who were the elders of the people. Looking now, you can see that all the Jewish leaders had mobilized. Because of Jesus, they were in danger, in risk of losing their economic interest and religious authority. So they had all come together. So with every possible means, whatever they could do, they were trying to kill Jesus. And so they had all come together for the purpose of trying to kill Jesus. However, at that time, Israel was under Roman rule, so the Sanhedrin could not exercise the right to execute. They did not have the right to kill someone. So they took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea at that time. Pilate's original headquarters was in Caesarea, and their, the headquarters was in Caesarea, but there was some news that there would be riots near Jerusalem during pa the Passover. And because he had heard this report that there might be potential riots near Jerusalem during Passover, he had temporarily moved to Judea and set up a headquarters in Jerusalem. And at that time, the incident occurred where Jewish leaders arrested Jesus and held an illegal trial and requested to have him executed. They were so fixated on killing Jesus that they brought up various charges against him. The verdict made by the Sanhedrin session for Jesus' trial was blasphemy because Jesus claimed to be God, so they accused him of blasphemy. However, since 
This did not lead to the death penalty in a Roman court because in a Roman court, they do not believe in a God. So there's no such thing as a trial for blasphemy. It was no verdict that would lead to death. And so what did they request of the Roman court? They accused Jesus of treason before Pilate. The content of their charges is mentioned in Luke 23 and is largely organized to three main things. First, they said that Jesus was trying to incite the Jews to revolution. Second, they claimed that Jesus forbade them from paying taxes to the Roman emperor. And lastly, they claimed that Jesus was claiming to be a king. So they had racked their brains to force a charge against Jesus. Let's look at verse 6. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested, a man called and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barnabas. Pilate, in his conscience and knowledge of the law, found no grounds whatsoever for condemning Jesus to death. Also, in Matthew 27, during the trial, Pilate's, there was, Pilate received a note, and it was from his wife. And so Pilate's wife said, I had a dream last night. And, and in the dream, Jesus was righteous, so you should just let him go. Pilate's wife said that to Pilate. And so, because it was, it was a holiday at that time, it was a festival of the Passover. During these festivals, it was a custom to release one prisoner. And so, even Pilate had seen that whatever Jesus did was not means for an execution. And because his wife had said that too, he wanted to release Jesus. It was kind of like a special customs in, in like ones that are held in Korea during Independence Day or Christmas Day. And so Pilate wanted to release Jesus through the special customs. However, the situation was reversed. The crowd at that time were all controlled by the high priests and they wanted to release Barabbas, a vicious criminal, instead and they started to shout to crucify Jesus. They, this, this crowd started to chant crucify Jesus and asked to release Barabbas. So if you look at verse 15, it said, So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scorched Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Pilate ultimately handed Jesus over to be crucified. But the reason for this is truly pathetic. It said, wishing to satisfy the crowd. Pilate's decision to crucify Jesus was driven by the desire to please the people. In modern terms, it's a populism. It was a populist trial. He comprised, he compromised with reality to avoid any major issues during his governance of Judea. For his success, he wanted to compromise and to, to satisfy the public. In the end, he made an introductory choice. That is why even as people go to church, there are many people who make introductory choices for their physical satisfaction and physical benefits. According to history, Pilate later massacred many Samaritans. He ended up killing many people, and later on, he received a summons from the Roman government. And realizing that his political career was over, he ended up committing suicide. Pilate later on ended his life by suicide. And even today, every time we recite the Apostles' Creed, Pilate is remembered with the most shameful and cursed name. We say, suffered under Pontius Pilate. 
The reason Pontius Pilate's name is recorded in the Apostles' Creed is to emphasize and show that the atoning crucifixion of Jesus is a historical fact. The legal responsibility rested on Pilate historically at that time because it's all recorded. However, like Judas Iscariot, Pilate made a choice he should not have made. And he is probably also regretting this in hell. We must not make choices that leave us with regret. Above all, we should strive to make choices that please God and not people. All y e o n believers, may you live a walk of faith before God. If you look at Galatians 1.10, the Apostle Paul makes this confession. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. If people are constantly worried about what people might think, what people might see, and if you're trying to please man, then I would not be a servant of Christ, says Apostle Paul. Especially when it comes to servants of God, may you not worry about what others might think and what others might say and not be influenced by people, but may you live before God. May this confession of the Apostle Paul become the confession of faith of every believer of the one church. And I bless all of you in the name of the Lord to become decision-making experts who bring the greatest joy to God. Point number two, Joseph of Arimathea, who chose the body. Verses 44 to 45, it said, Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And so, at this time, it said that Pilate, that Joseph of Arimathea, had gone and sought out the body of Jesus after Jesus had died as a result of Pilate's judgment. And that was Joseph of Arimathea. Because the man, at the time, the name Joseph was so common, he was called Joseph of Arimathea to distinguish him by his place of origin. But this man was not just an average person in society at the time. According to the passage, it says that he was a council member. Mentioning him this way meant that he was one of the 70 members of the Sanhedrin. And additionally, Matthew 27 mentions that he was an extremely wealthy man. In short, he was someone that had everything the world could offer. But if you look in the passage, he does a very risky thing. It said that he boldly approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. What was the charge that led to Jesus' crucifixion? It was treason. Jesus had been crucified on the charge of treason. But if someone is associated with traitor, then to be associated with that person means that you could also be associated as a traitor. However, to Joseph, facing death was not a problem. And if you look at verse 43, Mark describes Joseph of Arimathea as a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. He was someone who longed for God's kingdom. He looked for the kingdom of God and made a choice of faith, a spiritual choice. In John 19, we learn that Joseph of Arimathea was originally a disciple of Jesus, but he had not lived openly in his faith due to fear of the Jews. However, as Joseph witnessed the process of Jesus' crucifixion, he was transformed. 
by observing Jesus boldly walking the path of atonement on the cross according to God's will and plan, Joseph recognized that Jesus is truly the Son of God. And people who discovered that Jesus is the Christ their values of life completely change. If you look at Hebrews 11, 24 to 26, we see another person who chose to focus on the main body, and that was Moses. The passage says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pressures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. From a worldly perspective, Moses' choice would ha have been incomprehensible. They wouldn't have understood. He was a Pharaoh's. He was Pharaoh's daughter. He was Pharaoh's daughter's son, and he could have lived in the palace. But why did he choose to live with the Israelites? who were slaves. People would not have understood that. However, Moses had looked to what is eternal. When we live our walk of faith, we should not live with the standards of unbelievers. Even if unbelievers may say that we're being unrealistic and we're being foolish and idiotic, if you are one who waits for the kingdom of God, and if you truly have come to the answer and conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, then you do not live according to worldly values. You, may, may, you must make different choices from those values. For we make choices for His righteousness, for His kingdom. How would people in the world understand? How would they understand you who give your time, your materials? How would your family, your friends, your relatives? How would people around you, would under, how would they understand when they're unbelievers? They would not understand it. They would never understand it. However, all Yemen Church believers, may you, like Moses and Joseph of Arimathea, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, who gives us eternal rewards, and live as witnesses to expansion to the expansion of God's kingdom. Verses 46 and 47, and Joseph brought bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus in the new tomb, tomb he had prepared for himself, which carries significant meaning. And so when it comes to everything that happened to Jesus, it was fulfillment of the word. If you look at Isaiah 53, verse 9, it was already a prophecy that Jesus would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Moreover, had Jesus' body not been properly buried after his death on the cross, then there would likely have been more doubt surrounding his resurrection. If, if Jesus did not have a proper burial and if you know he was just buried somewhere, then there would have not been any evidence. But because he was buried in the grave of Joseph of Arimathea, where his grave was close by, where he was buried in a tomb and closed by a big boulder, it was historical evidence of his death and his resurrection. And after giving Jesus a formal burial, Joseph Arimathea played a crucial role in affirming the reality of the resurrection. Just like Joseph of Arimathea, our lives should be ones that make choices aligned with the fulfillment of God's covenant, a, a choice that God desires. And in, in from my experience, it could be sacrificial. And so at times it could be there needs there might it might require some type some type of self sacrifice. And so when it comes to the things of the world, it's easy, you could just follow. But when it comes to the, the 
will of God, it could feel burdensome and sacrificial. But when you really make that resolution, you you discover the joy, the deep inspiration and thanksgiving that God gives you within that. You must experience that. Many of our ministers and, and associate pastors experience this. You know, they have to restrict themselves and you you see how you overcome all these trials that the Satan brings to you by faith and you see the fruits of that faith. That's what associate pastors see in their ministry. Without that, it would be hard to continue this. But when you really experience and confirm how God is fulfilling His covenants and how God is using you and how God is with you and you feel that and you do the ministry, that's how you can continue. When you look at 1 John 2, 17, it says, The world is passing away along with its desire, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Those who carry out the will of God abides forever, it says. Amid various challenges and events, may all of you discern God's will and choose faith and the spiritual main body. If it's not God's will and it's not in your conscience of your faith and you decide based on how close your relationship and how long you've known someone, even if it's not God's will, you choose that, then you'll perish together. Even if it's if you're between married couples, look at Ananias and Sapphira when they made choices. Barnabas gave with joy, but Ananias and Sapphira, they saw, but they were envious. And so even when you are if it would, even when it comes to a married couple, you need to be able to make choices with discernment. And just because you're a family doesn't mean you need to yield everything. You need to be able to stand before God. When it comes to the work of God, if you are influenced by what your husband or wife says, if you're swayed by that, then you will not be used. Why are you asking them questions? You must ask God. And that's all believers of Yewon Church. May you stand before God and be used in a monumental, representative, and historical way to expand God's kingdom. This is the conclusion. In the 17th century, Thomas Watson, a leader of the Puritan movement in England, said, False saints can follow Jesus as far as the Mount of Olives, but they cannot go to Calvary. What does that mean? The Mount of Olives was where Jesus taught his disciples about the kingdom of God and where for 40 days he talked about the kingdom of God. And Mount Calvary was where Jesus bore the cross. In other words, anyone can participate in a setting where Jesus' words are heard, where they can receive the words of Jesus and receive grace. However, fake and false believers withdraw in the face of suffering. They refuse to go to Mount Calvary because it's tiresome and you have to sacrifice yourself. You have to devote yourself. They don't go. And they're fast when it comes to your calculations at that moment. It's difficult to distinguish who is true or fake simply by listening to the word because everyone seems like they're receiving grace. How could you discern that? However, when there is when the circumstances of Mount Calvary arises, that's when you are able to discern and make the difference. When there are difficulties that come, that's the test. When difficulties come, a true disciple, when faced with the time schedule of Calvary, makes the choice that God desires, even if it requires self-sacrifice, even if it's dangerous, and even if it's tiresome the choice that God desires. Genuine faith is not about making carnal or, or physical choices like Pilate, but making spiritual decisions like Joseph of Arimathea. We must not become blind by the introductory matters like Pilate. But we must be like Joseph of Arimathea, who, were led, who was led by the desires of the Spirit, not the desires of the flesh. And may you all, in the name of the Lord, make 
choices that align with God's will. That life is the life of the main body. So, all Yeon, all Yeon believers, may you stop living an introductory life, but live a life of the main body and be used in the fulfillment of God's covenants in the field. Let us pray, Father God. May all believers of Yeowon Church, as they live their lives, both physically and spiritually, when it comes to situations where they have to make a choice between two, in every moment, may they rely on the Word and make choices based on the Word, and may they become people of the Word. And during every time, may they pray and become people of prayer who make decisions while praying. May they realize what God has called me, why God desires to use me, and why God desires to use me for the expansion of God's kingdom. And may I always be awake and like Joseph of Arimathea, may I be able to make spiritual choices and receive an eternal award. May this be true for all our Yeowon believers. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.